أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله we have completed the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat the 49th Surah of the Holy Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with another opportunity to reflect on another Surah of the Quran a more lengthy Surah and over the next several sessions we're going to be spending some time reflecting uh, and sharing some insights on Surah Al-Anbiya. Now, Surah Al-Anbiya, as you can see in the Mus'haf, uh, from a sequential perspective, it is the 21st chapter of the Holy Qur'an. Now, chronologically, of course, it, it wasn't revealed in that order. Surah Al-Anbiya, according to the commentators of the Qur'an, is an early Meccan surah. It's one of the, what's one of the first lengthy surahs to be revealed during the early Meccan period. For those of you who are familiar with Meccan Qur'an, especially during the beginning of the prophetic mission, many of the surahs were very short. If you look at the last juz of the Qur'an, they're primary, they're predominantly Meccan surahs. They offer very powerful, you know, visual, uh, you know, uh, representations of the Day of Judgment. They're, uh, they're almost cryptic in the, way that, uh, in the way that they're presented. So many of the Meccan surahs are short. And you see that with the revelation of Surah Al-Anbiya, there's a break. So, this, so the Muslim community, the young Muslim community, is now receiving one of the first lengthy chapters of the Quran. Now, what's going on during the early Meccan period? Now, as you know, the Prophet was propagating Islam in secret for the first three years. And at year three, now the Prophet is publicly challenging the norms of Meccan society. And naturally, what's going to happen when you challenge the status quo, especially when you're challenging the status quo of a powerful tribe like Quraysh, who have economic interests in upholding the, uh, the status quo, naturally, any new message, any new religious movement that challenges those customs and those traditions is going to be met with fierce hostility. So when you look at Surah Al-Anbiya, it contains 112 verses. It's an early Meccan Surah, which means that the, the Prophet and the early Muslim community, they're in need of moral support. You know, there's a need to console the Prophet because he's going to have to withstand a tremendous amount of resistance and that's why you know just from a macro level when you look at the structure of of surah al-anbiya there are three main themes that you find in this uh, surah you can divide the entire surah into three chunks the beginning of the surah is basically allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the prophet that you have my support that Allah is consoling the Prophet to strengthen his resolve and his determination because the road that lies ahead is a difficult road. There are many challenges that you're going to face. There are many struggles and hardships that you're going to encounter. So the beginning of Surah Al-Anbiya is Allah's way of consoling the Prophet, fortifying his heart, preparing him for the mission that lies ahead. And that's why you see, after Allah consoles the Prophet and basically says that that you know, if I want to use you know modern language to you know uh, uh, you know layman language, Allah is basically saying that you know I have your back. Continue doing what you're doing. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the second part of Surah Al Anbiya, so the middle of the surah, a good chunk of the middle, Allah shares the experiences of past prophets. And subhanAllah, the, the structure 
of Surah Al-Anbiya is very similar to the structure of Surah Taha, which is the Surah that's right before it, Surah 20. Allah begins by consoling the Prophet. He shares with him the experiences of Musa, which incidentally are very similar to his own experiences. And then Allah speaks about you know, the consequences of, of, of the actions of those who accept the message and those who reject it. And similarly, we find a similar layout in Surah, Surah Al-Anbiya. God consoles the Prophet. You know, so the, the Surah begins with you know, a warning of the approaching of the Day of Judgment and then the different accusations that are directed towards the Prophet. Allah consoles the Prophet. And then he, he speaks about what happened to previous Prophets. And the idea here is that, Ya Rasulullah, you, you're, you're not alone. That what happened, what's happening to you is not something that's new. What's happening to you happened to Nuh, it happened to Ibrahim. And that is, that is encouraging. You know, that does give you, you know, uh, it, it, it is, it's, uh, it's comfortable knowing that there are others who also shared in your suffering. And that's the point of, of this surah, really, is to tell the Prophet that the, the horrible things, the difficulties that you're going to face are no different than the challenges that previous Prophets encounter. So the experiences of past Prophets. Now in Surah Taha, Allah only spoke about Musa. But in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to share the stories of many different Prophets and how they were able to persevere through those trials and how they were able to use those trials and tribulations to get even closer to God. That through their pain, through their suffering, they were able to even draw closer to God. That they turned that pain into power. So Allah tells, shares with the Prophet how previous Prophets dealt with adversity. And then the surah concludes with a discussion about consequences. So God sends these prophets. You either reject or you accept. And what are, what are the consequences of embracing the prophetic message? And what are the consequences of, of rejecting? Now, this surah, the reason why this surah is called Surat Al-Anbiya. Now, now, just as a side note, Anbiya, as many of you know, is the plural of Nabi. And just you know, for us to appreciate the reason, the, the, the linguistic meaning of the word Nabi. The word Nabi, it is according to Arab linguists, it is extracted from from two different roots. So the word Nabi basically conveys two ideas, two concepts. So the word Nabi, which means prophet, literally it comes from the word Naba. Naba. You know, there's a surah in the Quran called Surat and Naba. The word Naba means news, right? But it's a very specific type of news. Neba, it means it refers to news that is important and relevant. And the idea here is that prophets are called Nabi because the information that all prophets convey, whether we're talking about Adam, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, the information, the news, the message that prophets convey, that they, the message that they communicate is both important and it's relevant. So if you come across a hadith that you think is irrelevant, the problem is not with the statement of the prophet. The, the issue is in your lack of understanding. So one of the distinct qualities of prophets is that the message that they communicate to their communities is both important and relevant you know so it comes from the word neba and prophets are called nabi the second root that the word nabi is derived from 
is the word nabwun, nun, ba, ba, and wow, nabwun. And nabwun in classical Arabic, it refers to something that is elevated. It's something that is raised above everything that's around it. And the idea here is that prophets are elevated people. They're human, right? It's not that there are different species. They are from among human beings, but they are elevated human beings. It's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has lifted them up above others. And, and the reason why prophets are elevated is because their hearts are pure enough to receive revelation. So physically, there, there might not be a difference between us and prophets. You know, physically, you know, prophets have the same physiology as other people. That's why in Surah Al-Kahf, verse 110, even the Prophet ﷺ is instructed to tell his people, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Say to them, O Muhammad, that I am a human being just like you. So from a physical perspective, we're similar. The Prophet has two eyes, you have two eyes. The Prophet eats, you eat. The Prophet sleeps, you sleep. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ But what's the difference? يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ but I receive revelation. And that's why I am I am above others. That's why I am elevated. It's because I have access to divine knowledge that God communicates to me directly. Now, another, another thing that Arab uh, linguists mention, for those of you who are familiar with the Arabic language, there are two ways to make the word Nabi plural. One way is Anbiya, which is the name of this surah, Anbiya, and that is called Jam'u Taksir. It's a broken plural because the structure it change, changes. Whereas another way of making Nabi plural is Nabi Yun. You add a Wow and a Noon or Nabi Yin. You add a Ya and a Noon. And we call these plurals Jam Mudakkar Salim, a sound masculine plural, because we didn't break the structure of the word. We just added wow and noon, or we added ya and noon. Whereas with MBA, it's Jam Taksir. We we fractured the structure and we moved the letters around, we added or we subtracted, and we formed a plural. So why isn't the surah called Suratul Suratul Nabiyin? Why is it called Suratul Anbiya? Some scholars of the Arabic language they say that when when the Arabs would refer to a small number of prophets, they would say Nabiyun or Nabiyin. So, for example, you're talking about four or five or six, seven prophets. Or even ten prophets, you would you would admit, you would stick with the sound masculine plural nebiyun nebiyin. But if you're referring to a, a a large number of prophets, when you're referring to a large number, you employ the broken plural form, jamak taksir. And this surah, Allah doesn't mention you know two or three prophets or four or five prophets. There are 16 prophets who are mentioned by name in this surah. So among the prophets that are mentioned in this surah that we'll discuss, Musa alayhi salam, Harun, Ibrahim, Dhul Kifi, Lut, Ishaq, Ya'qub, Nuh, Dawood, Sulaiman, Ayyub, Ismail, Idris, Dhul Kif, Yunus, Yahya, Zakaria. So 16 prophets are mentioned. And, and some verses you know, go into more detail than others. So the surah is called Surah Al-Anbiya because 
it makes mention of a, a great number of prophets, some of the greatest prophets and messengers. Surah Al-Anbiya. So 16 prophets are mentioned. And I, I mentioned that there are 112 verses in the surah. And I mentioned also that from a macro level, the structure of the surah is the beginning, Allah consoles the prophet. He mentions the experiences of past prophets. And then he speaks about the consequences of, of human human choice, human action. Now, if I want to kind of zoom in a little bit more, just to give you a, a better uh, idea of what the content of the surah is, verses 1 through 10, Allah recounts the various accusations of falsehood and expressions of ridicule directed at the Prophet by the Quraysh. Quraysh being the superpower of the time. They're the most dominant tribe in the Arabian Peninsula. So Allah goes over these, these accusations. And this, this goes to show you the verbal abuse. So the Prophet was, wasn't only physically abused, he was verbally abused. You know, Quraysh, the Meccans, they, uh, they tried to destroy the Prophet's reputation. They, they engaged in character assassination. So there's, you know, there's a psychological and a physical attack being directed at the Prophet. Verses 11 to 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers a reminder to these people that, listen, they, there are those who came before you who mistreated the prophets, who rejected the message, and they were destroyed. There were people before you, there were civilizations before you that were mightier in power, but they were not able to ward off divine punishment. In verses 16 to 29, the impossibility of God taking a consort or having a son is discussed. And Allah speaks about the absurdity of more than one deity uh, ruling the universe. So there is an intellectual argument that is going to be put forward uh, about the existence of God and about Tawheed. Verses 30 to 33, again, I'm just going to give you just some quick bullet points, just so we, we have an idea of the, the, uh, the anatomy of the, uh, the surah. Verses 30 to 33, Allah invites human beings to contemplate the cosmos. Verses 34 to 47, human beings are reminded that all souls will taste death and will be judged. So a reference to the, the fleeting nature of this life. Verses 48 to 50, there is a brief mention of Musa and Harun. Verses 51 to 73, which is a, a, a big chunk of verses, there is a, a longer account of Ibrahim salam. A longer account of Ibrahim is given that includes his, his ruse of blaming the largest of his people's idols for destroying the smaller ones. So Ibrahim salam, when his people, they go to this polytheistic festival that they have, he goes into the temple, he destroys the idols, but he, he he preserves the largest idol. And then he blames the larger idol for destroying the smaller idols. And then there's a mention of how his people retaliate and they threaten to, uh, to burn him alive. Verses 74 and 75, there's a mention of Prophet Lut. Verses 76 to 77, Prophet Nuh, Nabi Nuh is mentioned. Verses 78 to 82, the surah narrates the story of Dawood and Sulaiman in, in which Dawood's judgment is overturned by Sulaiman. And inshallah, we'll discuss that uh, in detail. Verses 83 to 91, the rest of the prophets that I mentioned are, uh, are referenced. And then you find the last part of the surah addresses the end of the world and the coming of the hereafter. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions the, the tendency of religious communities to fragment when their members disagree among, amongst themselves. There's an account of the, the story of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Allah speaks about the ultimate end of the idolaters and their idols in the hellfire. So again, the consequence of human, of, of human choice. And then Allah speaks about the destruction of the cosmos and its renewal for the righteous. And then the surah ends, verse, verses 105 to 112, Allah ends by speaking about how the Prophet is a mercy to creation. So again, you see this balance between divine warning and glad tidings. And there's a reminder that the warnings that the Prophet has issued, that the Prophet has given fair warning regarding what is to come. That you can't you can't claim ignorance. You have been fairly warned, and the surah ultimately ends by saying that even the Prophet sallallahu the greatest messenger of God, the the human being who enjoys the closest proximity to the Creator, does not know when the day of judgment will take place. Now, with that said, I'll just mention one hadith that highlights the merit of reciting and studying this surah. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us the reward of, uh, of the recitation of this surah. The, the hadith is uh, from the Prophet And it says, Man qara'a surat al-anbiya. Whoever reads surat al-anbiya. And really, brothers and sisters, we're very fortunate. You know, there are many Muslims who go, who live their entire lives and they don't recite certain chapters of the Quran. Now, if you're a practicing Muslim, you're, you're going to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and another short Surah. Many Muslims, that's all they ever recite. Maybe on the nights of Qadr, a few verses here and there. But the reality is, not many people have the tawfiq to recite the longer Surahs. So, Man qara'a surat al-anbiya, whoever reads surat al-anbiya, hasabahu allahu hisaban yasira, Allah will give him an easy reckoning. Wasafahahu wa sallama alayhi kullu nabiyin dhukir ismuhu fil Qur'an. So there are two rewards that are mentioned, that are given to the one who reads Surat Al-Anbiya. Number one is that the reckoning for that person will be easy. And this in and of itself is a great reward. And then secondly, you will shake hands on the Day of Judgment with all of the prophets that are mentioned in the Qur'an. So all 26 prophets that are mentioned in the Qur'an, you will have the tawfiq of shaking their hands, being in their presence on the day of judgment and on the day of judgment if there's anyone who you want to be with it's with with mbia with prophets thank you very much for the lecture so uh one question about the idea of um, the prophet being offered consolation uh in the surah it's something that's come up in previous surahs as well it feels unusual to have the Quran focus on consoling the prophets since one, this is a message for the masses and also other, Allah had other avenues to send messages aimed directly at the prophet. Um, could you please talk about why this was uh, an appropriate way for the prophet to be consoled by Allah? And what we're supposed to be getting yeah. from it? Yeah. So, so, there are many things that can be achieved from uh, from this, uh, the consolation that God offers the prophet. And uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. So number one, it, uh, it's a good way to establish that the Quran is not the word of the prophet. Because if the Quran was the word of the prophet, it doesn't make sense that you're consoling yourself. So it's, it's in some ways, when Allah consoles the prophet, it's a reminder of who the speaker is. 
that the Quran is God speaking. It's not the word of the Prophet. Secondly, it's also important for, for us to never forget that the Prophet is also a human being. You know, sometimes when we read about the Prophet and we speak about the Prophet, they're so spiritually extraordinary that sometimes we forget that they're human. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by consoling the Prophet, by giving him that moral support, it's a reminder that yes, he is the messenger of God and he is superior to you in the spiritual sense, but he feels just as you feel. You know, he's a human being. And it highlights the importance of emotional well-being. That if you want to be a leader of a community, even within your own capacity, you also need a support system. You know, you need God. You need dua. You're not, you can't do it all alone. So kind of revealing that vulnerability, I think, is a powerful message. And this, the consolation, even though it's directed in some instances to the Prophet, it's also for the Muslim community. It's not only for the Prophet because the early Muslims were also in need of that, of that consolation. And that shows you that people feed off of the morale of their leaders. That if a leader is demoralized, the follower is going to be demoralized. So this is also an important lesson in in, uh, in leadership, that, that we're affected by the psychological and emotional state of, uh, of our leaders. And of course, there may be many reasons, but these are just some of the few that come to mind. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It was a very, very informative uh, session today, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, that uh, was Harun also a prophet? Because a lot of uh, books say that he wasn't. So the Quran, the Quran explicitly mentions that uh, that Harun was uh, was a prophet, but the the way he became a prophet was unique. He was appointed by a recommendation. So Musa, see Musa didn't appoint Harun. He made a dua, وَجْعَلْ وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي Harun أَخِي So he was a prophet, and inshallah we'll, we'll speak about the verses that, uh, that mention Harun, but he was, a, he was a, a prophet of God, and he was appointed uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as the answer to Musa's uh, prayer and this is also a very delicate point and this shows you that even a prophet cannot appoint another prophet that it, it needs that divine approval so Musa doesn't say I appoint Harun as a prophet with me because he's my brother he has to ask Allah oh Allah make make him my uh, my wazir so even a ma'soom doesn't have the authority to appoint without without divine permission. 